Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance in Chicago. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, we've got an exciting program uh, talking about the private competitor to the National Railroad in Italy for high speed rail. Uh, but first, a couple of things. Uh, background on the High Speed Rail Alliance, we're a nonprofit educational organization. We strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high speed rail is, why we need to build it, and what steps local leaders can take to make it happen. Uh, we provide educational uh, programs to a, a variety of folks. Uh, this is one, uh, very active in giving presentations to rotaries, uh, et cetera, with the idea that we're building a movement from the ground up so that if uh, people are in senators' offices in DC, the senator can't say, I haven't heard about this from my district because we will make sure that people are telling them he wants it. Um, and then we help provide the tools that people need in order to educate their leaders in their state capitals and in Washington, DC. Um, if you like what you see today, please uh, make a donation at highspeedrail.us. Um, I dug through the prize closet. I'm sorry this isn't Italy related, but um, I did find a maglev model of a Japanese maglev train back, uh, buried back in the prize closet. If you call or send an email and make a donation um, over the phone, we'll do it for you online. Uh, we'll send you one of those. Or if you just want to make a regular donation, highspeedrail.us. The other thing I wanted to share real quick, just because it's something I stumbled upon today that I find fun, um, is this advertisement that the uh, high-speed rail operator used in Taiwan. Um, on the left-hand side, you see before high-speed rail, and they had these labels, but uh, we've added them in English. Uh, before high-speed rail, it was just the grandparents for the weekends, how lonely and boring. After high-speed rail, you've got the kids and the grandkids coming for the, a weekend visit. And so high-speed trains let you be there in person. And that's why we're doing this, so that people can be there in person more often, which leads to more economic activity, stronger family relationships, stronger businesses, um, all while reducing the amount of carbon we're putting into the air, even though we're traveling more often. Um, so Italy um, has already developed a, a tremendous high-speed rail network that would actually um, span probably from St. Paul down to Indianapolis or further. Uh, they started building that in the 70s and are continuing to expand it and soon we'll be connecting it uh, through the Alps to the French system and have already connected it to Switzerland and Germany through the Alps more directly to the north. So I'm really happy to have, and I'm sorry, Andrea, for, um, uh, I'm gonna try, Andrea Gurichin, sorry, um, who's a consultant to Italo, uh, the, the private operator that competes with the National Railroad in Italy. So you know, take it away. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Thank you very much for this invitation. I, I will try to explain in 20, 25 minutes uh, a little bit the history of Italy and what is Italy and what is the competition in high speed rail because Italy is a little bit uh, a, a unique business case or it was a unique business case. To, be, uh, to make this, I prepare a presentation that I hope that you can see right now, great. So this is the case of Italo, is the first example of competition in the high-speed rail. Here, as you can see, I work uh, with Italo uh, since 2009 right now. I'm a consultant for the CEO of Italo. Uh, I work also for the World Bank and also work in the high-speed rail in South Korea, but also in China. So my experience is especially, I, I started with Italo, with the first CEO of Italo, and then I start to see a little bit the experience all around the world. Let's think that all around the world, we have more than 50,000 kilometers of uh, high-speed rail. That means more than 30, 35,000 of miles uh, that, uh, of a high-speed line all around the world. 
and is growing. It's growing very fast, as you can see in two years and a half, from July 2017 to February 2020, we saw that we uh, add 15,000 kilometers, so quite 10,000 miles. And that's not just a unique business model. Uh, you are discussing U.S. right now. We heard about uh, Biden, President Biden, that told that uh, competition is very important to introduce uh, in the next period for Amtrak and in the long distance rail. But we have different uh, business model. We have a vertical integration model like Japan or Kong, Hong Kong. We have vertical separation like Sweden or UK. And Spain is a little bit the case, but uh, with, with two different companies. And then we have a whole structure like Germany, Italy, and Austria. What means all this structure? That means that the Ministry of Economy in Italy is the owner of 100% of FSI holding, that is uh, Ferrovia dello Stato, that is uh, the incumbent, the historical company that from a part, they are the owner of the infrastructure, RFI, the infrastructure manager. And the other side, they have uh, the railway undertaking that is a train Italia, that have also high-speed rail. Of course, there's also private rail freight undertaking that are using the same infrastructure of RFI, and as Italo, that is uh, the high-speed rail private operator that are using the same infrastructure of Trenitalia, that is RFI. Uh, to use this infrastructure is a fixed price by independent authority for transport, that is a uh, name authority for uh, uh, regulation uh, of regulation for transport, that fix the access charge to use the infrastructure. It's uh, quite theoric, but it's very, very important at this point, uh, especially if we are, want a great competition. What about Italo? Uh, Italo was created in 2006, at the end of 2006. Uh, in 2007, 2008, they bought the first 25 train, that is AGV train from Alstom. And then on 28th of April, 2012, finally, uh, of course, they started uh, with the first operation. And uh, from 2012 until now, there's a grow because uh, the company bought new trains at the beginning, just uh, eight, uh, High speed uh, Alstom Evo, that is uh, 250 kilometers per hour, the maximum speed. And then they bought finally in total other 26 trains. So right now it's a 51 uh, trains, the fleet of Italo. Uh, there's also other services, but we will speak later, like Italo Bus, that is intermodal services with buses uh, connecting the main high speed rail station. Uh, to start this adventure, it was very important to make a big investment. Uh, between 2008 and 2012, there was around 1 billion euro, so 1.2 billion of US dollar uh, of investment. Before starting, we're speaking about 625 million of euro uh, for train investment. We have maintenance facility, IT investment, station logistics, and so on. So finally, it's quite around uh, 1 billion euro uh, of investment investment in this period before starting. The break-even point arrived in 2015, and of course, they bought new trains. About the shareholder of Italo, just to make understand to you, at the beginning was created by main entrepreneur in Italy, and also main bank and main, uh, main insurance group, especially before 2018, where we have a big change. Uh, we had the first Italian bank in Tesa San Paolo. We had the first insurance group that is Generali. And we have a main entrepreneur like De La Valle, Montezemolo, Punzo, e Cattaneo, that they have a, a part of, uh, a, 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 big, a, a very important part of the shareholding. What happened in 2018, on February 2018, uh, GIP, Global Infrastructure Partner, that is an infrastructure fund from US, uh, they decided to invest around 3 billion of US dollar to buy, to buy Italy. And then, as you can see right now, is the shareholding is something like that, that you can see in the, in, the, in this cake. And uh, still, uh, Global Infrastructure Partner is the main shareholder. We saw some uh, uh, reinvesting shareholders uh, that also has an important part. So it's very, very interesting that is a, a US fund that is the owner of Italo right now. About some results about Italo. As you can see here, there's a strong growth in terms of passenger. In 2014, there was just 6.5 or 6.6 uh, million passengers. In 2019, there was around 20 million passengers. And in terms of FDA margin, it all was very profitable before, of course, the crisis of COVID-19, because it was very well managed. As you can see here, there's two typology of the train here. You can see the AGV train here, you can see Evo train, but also the FDA margin was very, very good for Italo, because even if the price was very low, 
the price of the ticket was very low, but Titolo was very able to uh, be uh, cost efficient. In terms of load factor, the load factor, the last estimation was around 80%. That is very high in the uh, rail industry because there's many stop is not like point to point like we have in the aviation business. And uh, we had four classes. So there's a strong innovation because Italo started to innovate with the four classes, with Club Prima, uh, Comfort, and Smart. And also, it's very, very interesting that it was developed this kind of Italo bus services uh, that uh, is connecting the main station, uh, the main high-speed station with this kind of services. So if you want to go to Costiera uh, Amalfitana, uh, you can arrive with a train in Salerno and then you can take a train going to Costiera Amalfitana. Uh, about the four classes, it's very high quality. As you can see, there's a club uh, that is high comfort and privacy. There's customized service lounge option. So you can close here a door to have a lounge option for four people. So you can travel between Milan and Rome uh, with a totally privacy. Uh, you can have meeting on board, a uh, board meeting on board. Then you have a first class Prima. Then you have a comfort that is a uh, the same quality and comfort, but without services. And then you have a smart that is the economy class, but is very high quality too. And so this is a uh, four classes that it was a very, very important uh, for the customer to find the best solution for every single customer. In terms of innovation, it is very innovative because they created at the beginning a service oriented architecture where all the subsystem was speaking to the other uh, subsystem. So you have a front office subsystem like CRM distribution, you have back office um, um, subsystem that are speaking all together. So we it all know exactly what kind of customer is on board because there's a good customer loyalty program. And uh, it's possible to match all this information, for example, with the crew and the people that are on board to give a special services like uh, to have people that speak Chinese on board uh, when there's a big group of Chinese. Of course, all of this before the COVID-19, uh, because right now, as you know, uh, Chinese uh, market is closed. But of course, uh, it's uh, all the all the all the um, all the staff on board speak, for example, English. So there's no problem for U.S. tourists to go on board of Italy to have all the information. And then another element that is very important is the revenue management. Uh, Italo have a different uh, kind of ambiences, so different classes, but also different flexibility on the price. You have a full flexibility to the less flexibility. This is just an example for some years ago, just to give you an example, but a Milan room that is uh, around, uh, uh, is uh, like uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, just to give you an idea, uh, Milan room routes, and you can buy the ticket for around $12. Uh, you could buy for $12 the ticket, it's of course an economy class, but then you have a different uh, flexibility. For example, full flex was much more expensive, but you have also club, for example, starting from 60 euro, that is around $70. So it's very, very interesting because you stay on board for three hours with a Wi-Fi for free, for example, working on board, taking your train in Milan, arriving in Milan, working three hours, and then you start your day in, in Rome. And you pay probably $12, that is less than the taxi to arrive to the station. That is very, very interesting. And uh, I have just a short video that I hope that you can see. As, as you can see, Italy is really a unique model in the world. Yeah, there's uh, some nice picture and uh, but why is so unique because we start in italy with the competition it's the first country to have competition as you can see here i help bloomberg business week to write an article carol metlek uh, wrote an article about the new discount airline models coming for european uh, railways in reality it is not a low cost because it's a full cost in terms of uh, full service uh, full service uh, carrier like in the traditional airlines so you have competition on the same rail. This is very incredible. And this is very interesting because it's the first country in the world to have that in the high-speed rail. Uh, of course, what is uh, called here is Italian revolution because I have also to write this article that what we saw that finally there's a, a big model shift from aviation and car 
to the rail. And this is very important, not only because of the infrastructure, but because also of uh, competition. And what happened in Italy in a few years? So in a few years, what we saw from 2011, a year before the competition, 2019, the last normal year, what we saw that the demand more than doubled. And we have the same infrastructure, more or less the same infrastructure in Italy. So we have a double of the demand in general for the high-speed rail in Italy. Uh, the GDP in Italy, unfortunately, is exactly the same 2019 and 2011. Uh, but what we saw is a strong decrease of the price. So there's a strong push uh, of the competition also to decrease the price. What we saw also in the aviation business uh, after the deregulation in the US or liberalization in Europe. But what is very, very interesting that the demand exploded and we saw a very high number of passengers on board of the train. And what we, is very, very interesting that even if there was the price that decreased around 35, 40%, the cake of the market of high-speed rail, so the, there's a strong increase of the revenue. So even if there's a strong decrease of the price, but the fact that the demand increased much more, we have a cake that is uh, much more bigger. And this is very interesting because finally, we have a market in 2017 that was 700 million euro bigger than in 2011. That is very, very interesting. I made some benchmarking with US just to give you an idea. Uh, in terms of price per ticket, uh, the price for uh, one passenger kilometer, so the yield for the high-speed rail, the Asila Express is around five, six times uh, more expensive than to take Italo. And Italo, as you told you, is 300 uh, kilometers per hour, so it's a uh, uh, 180 miles, more or less, uh, more than 100, uh, around 190 miles per hour. And what is very, very interesting that is much, much cheaper. And this is very, very interesting because it's very easy to travel from north to south or east to west of Italy, thanks to that. And those in terms of competition with the low-cost carrier, here I took a selection of the US and the EU uh, uh, low-cost carrier in the aviation business, the cost to produce a seat kilometer for Italy is lower than, for example, Southwest, and is much more, much more, uh, much more interesting because this is help a lot to have a modal shift from the aviation to the rail, and also because when you take the train, you go on board of the train and you start work. In the aviation, is in the aviation business model is completely different because probably you have to travel for one hour where you can work exactly very well. You have a security control and so on. In the rail market, the security control are not so strict like in Italy, are not so strict like uh, in, uh, in, the, in the aviation business model. So it's very, very interesting that on board of the train, you can be very productive. You can increase the productivity of the country thanks to that. And the cost for available city kilometer is lower. Uh, it's interesting because Italy was the first country and uh, the second country in the high-speed rail opening to the competition was South Korea, where I work. SRT started the operation in 2016. There was also a memorandum of understanding that I helped to create within SRT and NTV. So South Korea is the second country where we have a competition. Of course, it's a little bit different because the operator is not private, uh, like uh, as uh, Italo, for example. And the third country right now is Spain that started this year. And right now we have uh, two new competitors. A third one, it will arrive next year. And also here we saw a strong uh, decrease of the prices. For example, we start to see very low pricing uh, to go from uh, uh, Madrid to Barcelona. And the market is growing about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is very interesting because August 2021 is higher number than August 2019. And this is the effect of the competition. And this is very, very interesting. So this is the three cases that we have a real competition all around the world right now in the high-speed rail. And what is very interesting that at the European level, we create an association, so Italy is inside this association that is all rail, that is an advocacy group, that is a non-profit association that try to improve innovation and quality and so on. So Italy is the high-speed rail, but we have in the long distance market, we have more operators that are entering the market. So we start to see competition also in the uh, in the long distance market in Europe, uh, for example, in Czech Republic, Austria, and also Germany and so on. But Italy is the first country where we have a high speed railing competition. So this graph is very important because here, if we take the cost of available seat kilometer and here the length of the route, what we can see that Italo is uh, have a lower cost of available seat kilometer than a 
big numbers of low cost, for example, whaling or EasyJet, but also of full service carriers. So it's much more competitive on that side. So it's very, very interesting because Italo is able to take a big part of the market uh, to, the, uh, to the aviation. Here, just some example, uh, 2008, 2012, 2018. 2008, the high-speed rail was still not completed in Italy between Milan and Rome. 2012, the high-speed rail was completed but it was still not, it was just the beginning of competition. 2018, we have full competition. What we saw that from 50% of the aviation market of the model uh, share of the aviation market between Milan and Rome, we arrived to 32% in 2012 to 14% in 2018. Why? Because it's much more easier and much more cheaper to travel from Milan to Rome by train. So it's a very difficult for aviation business and there's many players also low cost that went out from the market and the high speed rail right now is a big majority. Uh, last few uh, information. Uh, so I will left the time for uh, question and so on. So I hope that I didn't run too much in my presentation, but there's a COVID-19 and COVID-19 was a strong impact on Italy and all around the world, also in the high speed rail. High speed rail have zero or quite zero traffic on April and May 2020. This is very similar. Is is a, a crisis that is worse than aviation. Then there was last summer, it was quite good numbers, uh, but still very far away from the normality. And during the last uh, winter in Italy, we have another lockdown that was very long. So also during the first part of the year was very complex. Yeah. And this is very important to take in mind because of course, uh, uh, it's a, a completely different world. What we saw during this summer, the market, the, the, the demand is coming back and the uh, in, internal domestic demand is growing very well. So it all start to add the, the new uh, new frequencies, new destination to the south of Italy or to the Adriatic coast, for example, and so on. So what we saw that we saw a lot of innovation also in terms of connectivity, uh, because in Italy, the high-speed train can, could use also the traditional rail uh, the traditional infrastructure. So it's possible to have a part of on high speed rail and part on the traditional rail. So what we saw, there was a, an increase of destination during the summer 2021. And uh, we hope that uh, it's possible to come back at the end of this year, maybe next year, because the vaccination is going quite well. So with this slide, I finish. I hope that uh, uh, it was not too fast, my presentation. There was a lot of slides in a few minutes. But uh, I'm here right now, Rick, for any question that you want to ask me. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, uh, unfortunately, you got me thinking you should come back and talk about Korea. Um, there was interesting there that, you know, the, uh, they have two different stations, one essentially on one side of Seoul and one on the other, and they split it between those two. Um, so that's a, a different take than, than a new. Yeah, way. they they when they make the new infrastructure in South Korea, is a totally like seventy kilometers uh, of new infrastructure, include the new Suso station, that is another part of another neighborhood of Seoul. But you have to consider that Seoul is a uh, twenty five million inhabitants or quite thirty million inhabitants, so it's a huge mega city that is a little bit different from uh, Milan and Rome, that are big city. Milan, the urban area of Milan is four million inhabitants. Uh, and Rome is quite the same, but of course, 25 million, you can think that uh, it's very extended city, very big city that is similar probably to Los Angeles. And I had a driver, I was over, before they opened up the CCO station, um, I had a hotel there and I had a driver come to pick me up. It took an hour and a half just to get to the train station to go on a train for an hour. Um, but uh, getting back to Italy, one thing that you prompted with your last slide was that typically around Europe, the government railroad got support to keep running during COVID, but the private operator did not. Was that true in Italy as well? So in reality, in Italy, what's happened that the government, we try to convince the government that to maintain the competitivity of the rail, not only for 2020, 2021, 2021, but also for the future, it was very important to support uh, the aviation sector, okay, but also the rail, because uh, we saw a lot of support, a lot of billion of euro to the aviation sector, but the Italian government 
decide to help also the rail sector. That was very good, especially with decreasing, uh, with decreasing the uh, access charge, so the cost of using the infrastructure, and also with some support for the first part of the crisis, that is April 2020 to June 2020. So it was very, very important uh, because uh, finally the government helped uh, help, uh, the, the sector. What is done by Italo, for example, that was very, very interesting is that, okay, they decide, okay, the government help us. What we have to do, we have to invest. And we have to invest, for example, with, to put on on board of all the 51 trains, the HEPA filter. So like in the aviation, you know, the HEPA filter helps a lot. The safety on board, Italo decided to invest around 50 million euro during that year, during 2020, that is the, the worst years ever, to invest 50 million of euro to, in, to put on board of all the train, all the fleet, the HEPA filter. So right now it's safer as the, to travel on board of an airplane to take the train in Italy, especially with Italo, because thanks to this investment. So the government helps, but the private decide to make big investment on that. And I think it's very, very uh, different kind of uh, mind on that. Excellent. Um, it was, you know, with those filters, I was worried because it, it's embarrassing, but we have trains in Chicago that were built in 1955 that are still running. Um, and I was worried about how they were going to put those filters in those trains. And it turned out they already did two years ago before COVID, but I'm glad to see that you, that it will have added those. Um, so there was a plan to up the speeds from 300 kilometers per hour to 320 that um, I don't think the safety regulator did not allow. Um, is, is there still work on getting up to those speeds on the main line or is, is that, what's the, uh, the the maximum The maximum speed right now is 300 kilometers per hour. Of course, the train could uh, run more than 300, also IGB, for example. Uh, but uh, finally, you have also the infrastructure and the infrastructure manager or the, 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 the regulator decide the maximum speed is 300 kilometers per hour. So right now, there's no big plan to increase that uh, because they, they increase also the cost of investment uh, or to the maintenance also for that. So finally, the maximum speed will, will stay 300 kilometers per hour for the next, uh, for the next future. Uh, of course, we have uh, other example around, around the world that we are already 350, we will we'll arrive soon at 400 kilometers per hour, but in Italy still we decide to have a 300 kilometers per hour. Okay. Um, and Bill Porter is asking, uh, do you handle any freight express packages um, and are you, is Italy looking at those markets, if not? So it's a very interesting question. Uh, Italo is not making this kind of uh, um, freight express uh, services, but for example, the competitor uh, that is in the freight sector, that is uh, the state-owned company, decided to, put a, to take a high-speed train uh, to take off all the seats and to organize for packaging because of, uh, of this market is growing a lot. So. Uh, there's a first experiment in Italy also about high-speed rail used for the high, uh, for freight and not only for the passengers. But there's, there's just one train, two trains that are right now right, running on that market. And, uh, but Italy is not that, doing it like, like that. And I've been interesting because since the days I started learning about this, everybody said, well, small packages should go by high-speed train. And I was really curious why, and I don't expect you to have the answer, but I've always wondered why SNCF decided not to replace its mail trains and it was time to retire them. Uh, but I think that's probably a different topic for a different day. Um, uh, Bari to Naples. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think we took Part of it was up to 125 when we were there in 2019, but um, yeah, but uh, ba Bari Naples will be completed on a high-speed rail. Will be completed in uh, uh, 2026. So the the, the plan is uh, 2026 to finish uh, this kind of infrastructure. Uh, of course, to arrive from Milan to Naples right now is uh, or from Rome to Naples 
that is uh, 150 miles, more or less. Uh, you need a one hour, five minutes, so uh, more or less. And uh, that's, uh, but uh, when we will finish also the Bari Naples, it will be very easy to reach, you know, also Bari, that is another important city on the Adriatic coast uh, uh, on Italy, that is a quite big city too. Um, uh, can you tell me the history of how competition came about? Uh, it was somehow decreed by the European Union, right? Uh, yes, of course, the European Union gave the possibility, but finally it was the countries that decided to introduce competition. In Italy, we have a decree in 2003. So the first decree to open the competition was in 2003. And we start to see uh, that it was possibility to open the competition. So Italy was, in, was created at the end of 2006 and was uh, really op in operation in terms of 12, 20, 2012. Uh, so it was a long story from the decree. But at the European level, finally, they took the example of Italy and they decided with the four railway package to introduce the competition on all the countries. Since last year, December last year, right now all the countries, sooner or later, they have to introduce competition. For this reason, Spain, uh, this year, even if there's a COVID-19, they start to introduce competition, we start to see the first effect. Uh, so there's a first decree, general decree, that gives the possibility to the country. Italy took this, this opportunity they decide to go in this direction. And then the European Union decide to oblige all the country to open the competition in the long distance market and the high speed rail. So we will see this, what happened in Italy also in other markets in the next five, 10 years all around Europe. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, I read a book called Italian Ways, which was really interesting book. And it was more a, a travel book talking about Italian culture versus British culture, but you ended up learning a lot about how people used the trains. And I think it was in that book where he talked about how when Italo started, they, you weren't allowed into Milan Central Station, instead had to go into Garibaldi, and then they even put a fence up to make it hard to get to the trains. Can you tell me more about that and how that got resolved? So, uh... Of course, it was not easy at the beginning uh, for Italo. There was a lot of fight with uh, the competitor. It was quite normal. And also the competitor, you have to think that there was a part of big group that also managed the station, the infrastructure and so on. So there was very, very complex on that. Of course, since when we have the authority of regulation of transport, we start to see that thanks to this authority, it's possible to have a, a fair competition. So the beginning was very complex. Uh, the, the history was the fences, it was in Rome, in Romo Stiense, that they put the fences to go directly to the, to the platform that uh, you need to go like five minutes going down and coming back, so you lose a lot of time. Uh, but at the beginning, for example, Garibaldi was the station of Italo because it was not possible to find place in uh, Milano Centrale. Uh, so finally, what happened that uh, the, the, the situation changed a lot. Thanks to the authority of regulation of transport that is independent authority, but that thanks also to the competitor and to the infrastructure manager that they understood that the competition is very good. And what we saw right now that Trenitalia, that is the competitor, thanks to the fact that is much more efficient right now, thanks to the competition, was able, is able to enter, for example, in Spain. Next year, probably we'll enter in Spain also Trenitalia as a part of ILSA, that is another company. So it was not easy at the beginning, but the situation finally has changed in the last years. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then with tickets, um, how do tickets work? Is it a completely separate system from buying a ticket on the on Trenitalia? Yeah, uh, the tickets you can go uh, buying, of course, uh, the train online. The majority of the tickets are sold online uh, via web, via application and so on. Uh, a, a small part still is with the agency, travel agencies, uh, because there's agreement, for example, for business traveler. And also, and also there's a, a small part that is in, in the station. So you can buy also the ticket at the station, for example, last, last minute ticket. And this is a, not a big part. But of course, is a separate system. You have a separate uh, ticket vending machine, for example, in the, in the, in the train station. So it's... Uh, it's, it was a very big investment to create your system, your, you know, 
uh, inventory system, your revenue management system, and so on. They both, of course, from uh, they outsource it to big companies that are strong in the business, especially that also partners that came from aviation business. But it's very, very interesting that there was a strong innovation on that and is completely separated from Train Italia and from the competitor. I just, um, I, the ticket machine reminded me, I had a meeting one day in Rome uh, in the morning and it could have been an hour long meeting, it could have been a four hour long meeting. Um, so I didn't know when to buy a ticket for um, and I had to be in Milan at that night and so it was so convenient. After the meeting, I just walked over to the train station, put my credit card in the Italo machine, and I was on a train within 15 minutes. And in Rome, three hours later. And you know, I wish we could somehow get that into business travelers' minds in the U.S. Just how easy that is, uh, because the trains are so fast and so frequent. Exactly. It's very easy. It's very easy to use the train. This is very important for business traveler. And this is a, a very big uh, change that could happen also in the U.S. Uh, I, uh, I teach from several universities in the U.S., for example, USC or uh, Michigan State University uh, and uh, other university. And when my students, because the students came, came to Italy, when they try the train, they are really, you know, uh, fascinated about this kind of change because in the U.S. it's not normal for my student from L.A., to use the train and so on. But when they came to Italy, they start to use the train. In one hour, 20 minutes, I'm from Rome, I'm in Florence. I can go just to visit Florence half a day and probably I will spend $40 for, to have the ticket. So it's a complete change of mind. And also US students that are coming from a different culture of train, uh, they change their mentality when they came to Italy. And this is a very, very important to show that it's very easy to, do, to, to take the train and to travel all around the country. Yes, I, I'm sorry to, to belabor the point, but I had another trip where I had another meeting like that. And I had seen a movie about why Naples pizza is so much better. Um, so I went to the, after the meeting, I went down to the train station, went to Naples, got a pizza and came back. Um, and it was a good pizza, very good pizza. <laughs> um, so how does getting the slots on the track work so that you figure out when the train schedules and how the train schedules are going to work today. So is the infrastructure manager that uh, organized the slots. Uh, this is very important because right now it's not easy to find the slots uh, right now, especially in the big, in the main station, for example, Milano Centrale, because uh, the system will grow a lot because Italo bought 51 trains, Train Italia bought 50 trains. So imagine that we have 100 uh, trains more with uh, more or less 460 seats uh, more on board of the on board of, uh, on the on the on the tracks and this is very interesting because it's the infrastructure manager that organized there's an agreement that is 10 years agreement between the railway company and the infrastructure manager but then every year uh, every uh, twice in a year there's a two different uh, schedule that is organized in advance you are, make requests and they find a way to organize all the system because uh, in Italy it's not like in Spain or like in Japan. We have a system where uh, on the high speed track is running just the high speed train. But when you arrive to the, for example, close to the city, the high speed train entering the traditional line where you have a commuter train, you have freight trains, long distance trains, and so on. So it's not easy to coordinate these urban nodes. It's completely different from Spain where you have a different system for the high speed rail. In Italy, you have also this matching between the freight rail, high speed rail, and so on in some part of the network. So this is a typical problem also in US. Uh, if uh, mm, especially you have to divide your line, uh, think about Nordic corridor, uh, that uh, you have also to, to share the line with commuter train and so on. So also in Italy, we have this kind of problem. And we find a solution between uh, the infrastructure manager and the railway company. It's not too easy, but uh, finally still we are succeeding. Personally, I think that uh, sooner or later we have to introduce some system, economic system, uh, because it's not easy. They, um, it's not easy to find some slot. Probably we are speaking about when we come back to the to the normality. Uh, right now, is there's a decrease of number of the train, but of course in the future we have to find a way to do that.
are Rick, you are muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so I think what you just said was right now, the prices are all the same for the slots, but maybe there have to be some sort of bidding situation in the future. Is that what you were saying? Um, yeah, for, for, so for the slot, uh, you don't pay for the slot, you pay for using the infrastructure. Okay, so the slot, for example, in the station still has no pricing. Uh, this kind of, uh, like in the aviation business uh, in, in Europe, for example, there's no pricing for slot. Uh, for using the, the infrastructure, we pay the access charge that is around 80 euro per train kilometer. Uh, so a train that run uh, 500 kilometers pay 4,000 4, euro. And this is, uh, this is the price. Of course, a part of the infrastructure is also uh, paid uh, by the state. So a part is paid also by the state, but it's uh, like in the highway system and so on, that partially is paid by the, uh, paid by the state, also in other, in other countries, for example, also in Italy for some highway, not all the highway. For highway, of course, is the taxpayer that is paying a part of that. So you have to find the best way and the best level also of access charge, track access charge, to have a very competitive system and at the same time to repay a part of uh, the investment that could make by the state. And I think it's very, very important and it's very complex. I work a lot on that, on, the, on this uh, kind of regulation. It's very complex, but it's very important point uh, to find also for a government. Um, so now you mentioned how sometimes the trains are operating on conventional track, um, which reminded me, so Italo has two different types of trains which perform differently. Um, can you explain the difference between those two and, and why they have them? Yeah, so uh, Italo have a, a fleet of two typology of train that is AGB 575, uh, that uh, is the first Alstom train at, uh, uh, that, uh, that bought Italo in 2008, uh, and they start the operation in 2012. And this kind of train is running 300 kilometers per hour, is uh, uh, 462 seats. So I, I read also the capacity of the train, 462 seats uh, with the four classes. And uh, this kind of train was bought because it was especially for Milan Rome Wolves that is a uh, quite old is 250 or 300 kilometers per hour, the maximum speed. So you need a very speedy train. Then Italo, they decide to expand the, the, the network also on the traditional rail. Uh, think about uh, that uh, between Milan and Venice, still uh, no 462 seats per train, of course. Uh, they have 11 cars. Uh, it's a one single train with 11 cars. I already answered to the, the question. And uh, this, uh, and uh, between Milan and Venice, for example, not all the infrastructure is high-speed rail. Uh, is uh, uh, between Milan and Brescia uh, that is high-speed rail, and between Padova and Venezia. But all the line will be completed in 2026. So Italy, they decide to invest new trains that is 250 kilometers per hour. That trains they have uh, 472 seats, so it's very similar. And uh, but that train is used more on the line where we have more traditional. That is a mix, uh, in many cases a mix, also between uh, uh, from uh, Rome to Venice is a mix uh, route. So you have a, from Rome to Bologna, you have a high-speed train, you have a high-speed line, and then from Bologna to Padova, you have a, a traditional rail. So they decide to make this kind of different of investment because of the network. So you have to think what is the best train for every single uh, for every single, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, routes that you want to cover. So the, I want to point out that the original, the first high-speed line opened in Europe was actually just north of Rome, uh, but we don't remember that because they didn't, it didn't cause a huge transformation like the TGV did. Um, but so it's slower, and so therefore the, the tilting trains that go to Venice can go on that high-speed line, whereas they would be too slow for Bologna to Milan. And then- Yeah, we, we, we need many years to complete the, uh, the high-speed uh, infrastructure network in Italy. It was the first country in Europe after Japan that was the first country to have high-speed rail uh, during the Olympics, the last Olympics. And uh, Italy was the first country in 77 to complete the first part between not all the part between Florence and, uh, and Rome. But then the old infrastructure, the main part of infrastructure was finished between 2008 to 2009. 
So the Milan Rome routes that is the most important routes finally was complete in December 2009. So it was a long process, uh, probably not the best uh, uh, example in terms of construction. Spain probably on that side make uh, make a good good things. Italy right now is using a lot of the infrastructure. This is very important. So you make a big investment for infrastructure. What is very important that you use a lot. In many times between Milan and Rome, you had a train every five minutes, every 10 minutes. So it's really between Italo and uh, Train Italia. So it's like a subway or something like that. It's like a subway in New York City. It's the, uh, if you take, can take, you lose your train, you can take the train from the other company for, I don't know, five minutes later, 10 minutes mm -hmm. later, and you arrive in Milan or Rome after three hours. So it's a completely different change of mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, you know, you're talking about subways. I did, uh, you know, uh, Beijing to Nanjing or, or Tokyo to Osaka. It's, it's actually busier than many. They have more trains than most US subways do. Um, I want to take care of Virgil. You were talking about how um, interstate highways are largely funded by the government where fuel taxes pay for the interstate roads. But actually what's not even understood beyond that is that the federal government has been subsidizing directly the highway trust fund for decades now. So the idea that gas, the highways are paid for entirely by gas taxes is complete fantasy. Um, so how did you cite the maintenance facilities since you, since you couldn't use the uh, Trinitalia maintenance facilities? Sorry, Rick. So, so, um, so another question was, when you were building the new maintenance, the new shops, uh, yeah. Yeah. how did you I, find I, I the found site? <laughs> did they have to be farther away? Yeah, yeah. So Italo uh, made uh, its own, uh, its own uh, maintenance depot, maintenance facility uh, in a very few months, in between 2009 and 2010. And uh, of course, is uh, not in the city center of the, it's, uh, in that case, it's a, it was built in Nola that is close to Naples, that is a half an hour from Naples, more or less. And that uh, and the maintenance right now is outsourced directly to the, to the producer of the train. The maintenance is done by Alstom and is a long-term contract with them. So what we saw also innovation by Italo in terms of this kind of things, because uh, many cases, not all the cases, but majority of the cases before uh, in the rail industry, we saw that the maintenance was made internally by a maintenance uh, department and so on. In this case, we have externalized totally the maintenance and you work on the contract. Okay, you make, that my train will make me this hundred of thousand of kilometer every year and I will pay this euro per train kilometers uh, in the contract. And this is very, very interesting because finally was, uh, um, was uh, outside the city and in the, in the station, of course, you have to reduce the time that you stay in the station because there's not a lot of slot. So in the station, many times, for example, in Florence, when you arrive in seven minutes or six minutes, you restart from Florence the other way and you go, you restart your travel. So it's very, very important to minimize the time that you stay in the station because the space in the station is very important and is not easy to find right now. Yes, we have that challenge at Union Station in Chicago, where they need to figure out how to get people on the trains faster and out of the station so that we can put more trains in there. Um, and okay, so we answered that. Um, do you know how, what percentage of the overall network is electrified in Italy? Uh, uh, quite the majority. Uh, in Italy is a big part of uh, probably 80%. It's a completely different from US. The, the, all the high speed, of course, is uh, uh, electrified, but the majority of the network is electrified in Italy. Uh, but I can find uh, more data about that, but it's completely different from US. In Italy, quite the majority is electrified train. And uh, there's uh, very, also the freight trains, the majority is uh, electrified freight trains. So very different from, uh, from US and also okay. from other countries. And then um, does your frequent flyer program partner with any of the airlines? Yeah, uh, so it, uh, mm, Italo, I, I was searching the, the, the question, but uh, uh, Italo Create is a frequent flyer program. 
that is very important because it's possible to give you know benefits uh, directly to every single customer. It's very important to know each every single customer. So it's possible to make free upgrade, for example, for some customer that have some delayed in the last travel and so on. So it's very it's very similar what we saw in the aviation business. And there was in the past also some program uh, together with some airlines in terms of sharing the points uh, with some of that airlines. Of course, right now it's not working anymore, but it's very interesting that also there was this kind of experiment in terms of sharing the points, like to make an alliance also for the points as we saw for example, in the aviation business. I travel a lot uh, intercontinentally, so I, I use a lot this kind of frequent flyer. And I can tell you that Italo is really on the same side, but what is used is not just the car, but you using the app. So it's much better to, to have your loyalty car, your points and so on in your app. And the app uh, is very, very fr uh, user fr friendly. And I think it's very, very important on that side. Uh, let's see, I think we've covered just about everything. Um, are there any questions out there that uh, people haven't answered or that we haven't answered yet that people have? Put them in the Q&A session now. Yeah, I saw some, I oh don't know, some chat. Okay. Okay, no, I saw some chat. I, I'm trying to see other, uh, <laughs> What prompt? Ah, uh, that kind of degree. Okay, they, uh, I saw the last question that I received from Roger. Roger, um, okay. that's uh, um, in reality that kind of decree two thousand three was driven uh, by the European Union. In terms of European Union, give the possibility, and Italy decide to take this uh, possibility. Uh, the investors, uh, uh, the first idea of investment arrived first in the freight trains. Uh, because uh, also freight train was liberalized at the beginning of, uh, in that case, 2009, 2001, sorry. And uh, in reality, the idea of Italo arrived at the end of 2006. So first there was the decree and then was investor that understood really the potentiality of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the of the competition. And finally, it was not easy at all because the beginning was very, very difficult until 2015. But there was a great turnaround of the company, thanks to the former CEO of the company, uh, Catania, that uh, make it really profitable, the company, as, it, as you can see. So uh, probably it's not investor driven. It was more that uh, opportunity that came from the uh, European Union. Italy understood that probably the best way also to reform the incumbent was to introduce the competition and uh, using a competitor to increase the competitivity of, uh, the, of, the, of the incumbent was also used probably in South Korea. So in South Korea, they use the SRT, uh, that, that was the new entrance, also to increase the competitivity of Corail. So this is, we saw a lot on, on this in many markets, not only in the rail markets, this kind of example. So I hope that I answer about that. Okay. And then in a similar vein, um, how did Italy look at, or? Were there any lessons that Italy learned from Britain before they started the competition? <laughs> it's a completely different uh, business model. I, I remember that I helped a few years ago. I tried to help the, uh, the, the CMA, the Competition Market Authority in the uh, UK, to tell, okay, the experience in the UK is completely different because the privatization was completely different than in Italy. Uh, in Italy, we have open access. In UK, there's quite nothing of open access. Just one, two percent of the market is open access. All the system is a franchisee that is very complex to make working. In Italy, what we saw that is okay for the high speed rail, there's open access and using the infrastructure, all the players that want to enter, they can enter. So it's a completely different business model from UK where you have a franchisee that is won by a player and is uh, the difference between competition uh, for the market and competition in the market, you know? And this is uh, very interesting. Italy, like Spain, and all the other countries are going for open access competition right now. Uh, Great Britain is a different example with some mistake from, uh, from, my, from, my, from my idea. Of course, some good points, but also a lot of mistakes. And finally, it's a completely different model because the open access in UK is a very small part of the cake of the, of the rail industry. Okay. Um, and then, um, 
Uh, Fred has a question that I have strong views on, but uh, do you think that buy levels could be used to increase capacity in the future? The buy level, the, buy level trains. A buy level train. So um, is it already used, for example, in Spain, a new entrance, we go, are using that, what is called duplex train, duplex, that is a, a TGV, a TGV train that is introduced also in Spain. So it's already used to increase the capacity. For example, uh, we go uh, in, in France, that is also the brand in France, uh, we go have a capacity of 1,100 uh, seats per train. So it's a much, much larger train. And uh, in Italy, there's some problem in terms of infrastructure, uh, because not all the infrastructure is ready for duplex train. So that was the reason why also was used uh, the AGV train at the beginning. Uh, but of course, if there's any change in the infrastructure, it could be also used in Italy. But in other countries already use uh, this kind of train. And this increasing the number of seats is very important because you reduce the cost, of course, per, per seat. Uh, and this, this is very, very important, especially for low-cost model. And WIGO is a typical low-cost model in France and in Spain. Okay. And then it looks like we've got two more minutes. So yeah. Clark, um, I think the answer to your question is 10 years, right? For the commitment for a, a slot on the railroad? Uh, yes, there's a, a 10 years agreement between infrastructure manager and railway undertaking. And then uh, in terms of slot, in terms of uh, schedule is uh, two times per year that you change the schedule. There's a summer schedule and the winter schedule, a little bit like in the aviation business. But the generic agreement uh, between the infrastructure manager and the railway undertaking is done uh, normally for long term because you need at the same time something that is sure for you as an investor that you will have capacity. And at the same time, you need also a little bit of flexibility because maybe you have to adjust your schedule during, uh, you know, during the winter, during the summer and so on. And then last but not least, um, does the state-owned rail infrastructure company um, make a profit or does it receive funds from the government? So um, you have to think that uh, uh, Italo uh, make profits, as you saw, before the COVID-19, of course, that we are speaking. Train Italia for the high speed that is Freccia Rossa and uh, or Freccia service that is a red arrow or something like that also uh, make, uh, make profits. And the infrastructure manager make profits to around 200 million euro per year, but of course they receive also subsidies. So they receive every year uh, like subsidies of, for maintenance or for investment. So uh, the access charge in Italy cover all the maintenance cost, uh, the access charge of Italo and Trend Italia and so on, cover all the maintenance cost plus a part, a part of investment, what we call a marginal cost uh, plus model. That means that not all the full cost is covered, as I told you at the beginning, because there's model shift targets, climate change targets to have model shift uh, in Italy, like in Europe, uh, that is very strict. So this is the reason why they decide to invest a lot of money also in the high-speed rail. But at the same time, there's a, a part of investment are repaid by the, by, by the railway undertaking. Excellent, thank you very much. We just hit one o'clock. I really appreciate this. It's very, very interesting. Um, thank you thank so much you for coming during. I don't know. Is is this dinner time? Seven o'clock and eight o'clock yeah. in Italy. Yeah. So I I really appreciate that. Um, thank you all to for listening today. Remember, call us, our office if you would like a maglev model um, or hsrail.us to make a donation. And uh, Andrea, we will talk again soon. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Bye bye.